uh, registered the opening keynote. The, now it's my great pleasure to introduce our first keynote speaker, Chieko Asakawa. She is an IBM fellow and IBM Distinguished Service Professor at Carnegie Mellon University, working in the area of accessibility. And uh, she has just started to serve as a uh, uh, Chief Executive Director of the Japanese National Museum of Emerging Science and Innovation. Last month, Chieko is accessibility researcher and blind herself. So she will also present how technology has improved the quality of her life. Chieko, welcome. Thank you, Kitamura Sensei, for your introduction. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. It is a great honor to be a keynote speaker at CHI 2021 today. I'm very thankful for CHI 2021 committee members and keynote chairs to give me these wonderful opportunities. This talk is on live, and I'm speaking to you at Carnegie Mellon University by getting support from CMU team. I'm Chieko Asakawa, IBM Fellow and Distinguished Service Professor at CMU. The title of today's talk is See What I Mean, Making Waves with the Blind. During the talk, um, I want to introduce how inconvenient lives for the blind were before technology became available and how far we've come so far with the technology. I also talk about my latest project, AI Suitcase, um, navigation robot project for the visually impaired, including challenges and possible solutions under the pandemic. I want to then discuss challenges to implement new technologies into society to improve our lives, and what the Kai community can do to help make it real. I hit my left eye on the side of a swimming pool when I was 11 years old. After that, I gradually lost my sight, and by the age of 14, I was totally blind. My biggest fear was losing my independence. People thought I can't do anything because I cannot see. Mm, good. I thought People should understand, even though I cannot see, there is a lot I can do. Here is where I am from, <laughs> Osaka. I have spent my life developing technology to help the visually impaired. Floor change to tile. We built an AI-powered guide that uses IBM Watson. The library is in 40 meters. To help the blind navigate the world. <laughs> It is already working in cities like Tokyo and Pittsburgh. I hope eventually it will help millions more people like me live in a world that is accessible for everyone, everywhere. Your gate is in 50 meters on the right. I just introduced my long life in 90 seconds. After I became blind, I found there are two difficulties for the blind to live. The first difficulty was to access the information. In those days, there were no personal computers, no internet, no smartphones. I couldn't read books, magazines, newspapers, or any book by myself. As for textbooks, I have to often ask my brothers to read to me so that I could type in braille myself and get ready for classes. Human computer interaction. This book is help meant to help the readers learn how to program in C. It contains a tutorial introduction to get new users started as soon as possible. See, it's noisy and energy consuming. It was really painful and I didn't like it so much. I guess my brothers were not happy either. I later noticed they were not always there whenever I needed. Um, another difficulty was mobility. I couldn't go to school by myself. I couldn't go out shopping by myself. 
I couldn't go anywhere by myself. I really wanted to be freed from relying on someone. I wanted to be independent. That became my strong need pushed my back to ignite innovation. Okay, that was the situation about 1970s and 1980s. Time has passed, and now we are in the 2020s. We can access the latest news articles, follow the SNS information, anywhere, anytime without a vision. There is no problem to check bank account. We can attend online meetings. Everything has been extremely changed, and I wanted to show you these amazing technologies today. After many twists and turns, I joined IBM Research in 1985 and started working on accessibility. I then found out that IBM has a long history of accessibility technology and promotion. Back in 1914, IBM hired its first employee with a disability. That was remarkably early, long before society began paying attention to such issues. In the 60s, IBM developed a talking typewriter shown in the slide. In the 80s, a talking terminal was developed. You can see my picture using the terminal. In the late 80s, we started the Digital Braille project. We developed Braille editing system and Braille network system to share braille data in a timely manner. The network was very slow because it was before the internet, and it took time to upload and download braille files. I remember it took one hour to upload just one braille book, but it worked. We are very proud that this project has become a de facto standard among braille libraries in Japan. Of course, and they have upgraded to the internet digital libraries, and now I'm one of its users. In the mid-90s, I was able to access the web in the lab under a kind of uh, special environment. I was astonished, because I could read newspapers at any time and every day. I could search for any information by myself. I desperately wanted to help all the blind have access to the web. I then found a um, different way to render the home page, so that instead of using the display, it used synthesized voice. That dramatically simplified my own user experience. That led me to develop the IBM home page reader in 1997, first in Japanese and later translated into 11 languages. Um, the homepage reader paper was published uh, in 1998 at SCM Assets, and the paper received the Long Term Impact Award from SIG Access in 2013. When the homepage reader became available, we received many comments from users. One I strongly remember said, Homepage reader is a window to the world. Internet now offered a completely new type of information resource to people with visual impairments. Now, smartphones are offering new experiences to the blind to access information, interact with others, and operate appliances at any time and everywhere. We also can do online meetings, online uh, banking, online shopping, booking hotels and airplanes, looking up dictionaries, listening to music, podcasts, finding favorite restaurants, communicating via SNS, and of course, emails and phone calls. Accessibility targeted apps are also increasing. Object recognition, text recognition, friend recognition, barcode detection, scene captioning, too many to even mention. This progress is not limited to the cyber world, but in the real world, too. Where finding and navigation tools are getting practically available. Combining with smart glasses, um, real world experience are improving. In this way, our daily lives without a vision are getting more and more convenient. Let me share my funny story. When a smartphone was becoming um, popular around 2010, I thought, 
it is going to be impossible for me to use. I didn't want to use it. I wanted to stick to a featured phone because it was much easier to make a phone call. <clears throat> Don't ask me how I feel now. I cannot think of my life without a smartphone. Combining the internet with digital braille and digital uh, audio made it easier for me to enjoy reading. Let me show you. Bard Mobile, get books, heading. Search the collection, text field, is editing, Yuval Harari, Sapiens, a brief author, downloading. Read, button. Rewind, play, button. Part 1. The Cognitive Revolution. Downloaded. Back button. Table of contents. Heading. First, uh, there are many kinds of books in these digital libraries, such as for science and technology, biology, physics, literature, science fiction, romance, cooking, children, and so on. Um, home appliances have changed for us too. Without tech, we have to put braille labels on touch panels of home appliances. Then I read the label to see if um, it is bake or broiler, turning up or down the temperature, start or stop, and so on. I have to remember, for example, the bake initially starts from 350 degrees and increases 5 degrees by 5 degrees. There is no way to check the actual temperature on the panel. There is usually space for one, only one braille character, so we have to often create our own abbreviations. My oven has um, bake and broiler functions, so my solution is to indicate B for bake and R for broiler. I needed to spend some time to get used to it. Okay, so I'm going to bake something. And so I'm going to set up the temperature to 410. So braille levels are around here. So I know this is bake. And I know it's going to start from 350, I hope. 55, and 10, I hope. And I will start. That's how it is with no technology. When we get a new appliance, we always have to ask someone to come and put bread labels on the appliances. You can easily imagine this hasn't been easy to ask under the pandemic. Fortunately, we have technology now. Please go to the video. So hi Daisuke, are you there? Yes. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, so I want to put this braille label on top of a cancel. So I think it's around here. Uh, yes. So please in instruct me. Uh, can you look down a bit and uh, yeah, left. left. A bit left, I think. You can, uh, no, no, sorry, uh, more left. Left, yeah. Here? Yeah, I think so. Oh, yeah, it is. We made it. Thank you. You're welcome. So, uh, it's pretty good, right? But it's still, um, it's not the best solution. You may already start thinking, how about Wi-Fi enable smartphone apps for appliances? Yes, please watch the video. Dryer on, dryer. Start, button. Click programs, hand wash slash wool, button. Hand wash slash wool, time dry. Air, quick bulky slash large eye, hand sanitize, anti-shrink, mix, cotton, cotton.
Next. Low heat. Off. Low heat. On. Um. Start. Button. Start. Remaining time 2 h 0 minutes. The number of such examples is increasing. Please watch the next video. Please step on the scale. You gained 4.4 pounds. Fat gains 1.1%. You look two years younger than your age. It can even summarize the information I need. Okay, you are not going to see my weight. The reason why I gained was, it's not, you know, I had too much wine. I just measured with the bottle of wine. Next, this is just a small device with a display. But with the app, I can easily um, find out the CO2 level. Aaron at 401cc6. Carbon dioxide. 1,217. Really good. So the next, uh, this is a pulse oximeter, which is not Wi-Fi enabled. It means I have to always ask someone to see the display. I was a bit worried if no one is around when needed. Uh, luckily, I later found a new device, which is Wi-Fi enabled. Everything is getting accessible and our daily lives with, uh, without vision are improving. In this way, technology is making waves for and with people with visual impairments. Now uh, you might understand how smartphone apps and new Wi-Fi enabled appliances like these improve the quality of life for blind people, making the impossible possible. The question is, can we keep this momentum going without any effort? Um, will technology be always accessible even if developers and researchers do not know how their technologies are used by the visually impaired? Unfortunately, the answer is no. Let me show you some examples of issues. The first example is burdens with the tech. Uh, with a button. First example is buttons without a text. Button. 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 Keeps reading buttons, 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 because there is no text information associated with these buttons. This problem is relatively easy to fix. Developers just need to know uh, the text should be described with these buttons. Similarly, an issue on the web is that each image should describe alternative text in uh, old, te uh, old attributes. The next example is inappropriate text for buttons. Minus active 20 by 20 dimmed button. Home sign up button. Main button inactive button. 87F1C15 1C024F12914E at 5491 b Drawing level dimmed button. Screen readers are read any information provided in accessibility metadata, but it is often not easy for users to understand. There is a way to add a custom label for UI components, but users have to always ask someone to see their screen, and such function doesn't work uh, for all applications. Anyway, I can share all the issues today, but one more example. WCPM. The user tries to toggle the switch. Hillman Library second stop. However, it opens WCPM. another page instead. Roots back button. Roots. This WCPM. switch is completely inaccessible WCPM. for screen reader users. But sighted user can control. Take sticker button. The shutter button is not focusable by the screen Take reader. Discover button. Take filter button. View dollar. Actual reading. Customer reading. The graph is hidden Estimated from the screen reader. reader. Button. 
Without correct accessibility metadata, a screen reader uh, cannot access certain elements. Moreover, blind users will not notice this problem because there is nothing to be read. It is hidden even if it is visible. Unfortunately, I found this problem with my familiar uh, dictionary app. I was using it every day. There was a, a function to register a new word to the flashcard. It was very convenient. One morning, I could not find the register button. The app was automatically updated during the night. I asked my team member about it, and he found the exact same course. I was very sad because I can't use my favorite uh, function anymore. I stopped using the app. That's when I realized that if we don't take any action, such useful tools may become useless in the near future. I guess I should not have just stopped using it. What can I do as a user? There are official guidelines to design and build accessible apps, similar to the web accessibility guidelines. However, as with web accessibility, there is no easy uh, solution to find and fix accessibility issues in apps. Several research works have been done for understanding the semantics of UI components from the screen pixels. One of such paper got the best paper award from this guy 2021. This paper combines machine learning and heuristics to make accessibility metadata from screen images. For developers, the simple way to check currently may be a use of a screen reader that is embedded in a smartphone device. Let me show you how it can be turned off on an iOS device. First, go to the settings. Then, scroll down and tap Accessibility. Tap VoiceOver. Turn on VoiceOver. VoiceOver on. Set VoiceOver on. With VoiceOver, double tap performs a single tap. VoiceOver off. When it is turned on, you can easily go through apps and confirm if it is working in voice. Let me summarize the points. First, we need to increase the awareness of accessible apps for smartphones. The awareness should be increased both for app developers and users themselves. One way is um, we might be able to uh, build some mechanism for blind users to report accessibility issues they found to developers. And as well, they might share accessible apps with their cool experiences. If we collect and publish such information, it may influence and push app developers and owners to make their apps accessible. I hope it will end up to create a domino effect to improve apps to be accessible. Second, uh, we need tools to check accessibility of apps for developers. Third, it would also be great if we could find ways for blind users to fi uh, find problems and fix them temporarily while waiting for apps to be fixed. We need new technologies to help both uh, developers and users. We need your help. A lot of research will be needed to make these solutions available. I hope we will find more and more paper at Kai. Uh, focusing on accessibility, both for cyber and real world. Nowadays, my research focus is the real world. Currently, while working in the city, I cannot recognize shops around me, um, items in the shop, or if there is a long line, or if my friend is approaching. I cannot perceive this visual information without technology that helps. That is my research challenge today. This slide shows my exact goal. Please watch the video. That is the flying eyeball. Chika, do you know what it is? It can't be identified. 
Maybe a kind of monster. Beware of it. It's too dangerous. It is very, very old Japanese TV program for kids. I liked it when I was a child and could still watch it. The little bird on the boy's shoulder is a robot named Chika. Chika helps the boy by whispering to him about everything around him, from the weather to approaching enemies. Um, it was, you know, science fiction in those days. But now we have AIs, robotics, and a variety of sensors. I decided that the time has come to make this happen. Technologies like this could notify me of um, crossing and traffic lights, bicycles on the street, stairs, escalators, elevators, and information for me to walk independently. Even more, it could help me uh, navigate to avoid collisions, wait for lines at a coffee shop, describe scenes, people's behavior in the real world, and so on. It is a great challenge to achieve the real world accessibility. We need a full spectrum of technologies, not only technology, but social science, uh, psychology, policy making, an interdisciplinary approach will be required to make it real. To accelerate the goal, I have been working with CMU researchers and students by launching Cognitive Assistance Lab. As the first step, we developed a smartphone app called Navco, an indoor navigation system for the visually impaired. It assists them to move around um, locations in the real world, specifically complex indoor locations. The slide shows how it works. The core of the app is a newly developed algorithm for estimating a location accurately enough to enable a blind person to navigate uh, with its help. It uses radio waves from Bluetooth beacons distributed across the venue and embedded sensors in a smartphone, like an accelerometer and a barometer. By combining uh, accurate uh, lo location information with the detailed topological route map with points of interest, the app can provide flexible route navigation and announcements of shops, restaurants, and so on. We also developed a set of tools uh, to support the uh, deployment of the system, such as beacon installation, assistance, map editor, and so on. There is a video of when the blind community first used it in an actual situation at a hotel in Pittsburgh. Approaching. Go up to the sixth floor by elevator on your right. Turn around. You might be going backward. Proceed 25 meters and turn right. It's an awesome experience. It makes me feel free to go where I need to go. This morning, I got out of the Uber car, turned on NavCog, and from the outside of the hotel, walked inside into my room without asking anybody for help. It was just great. Champions Club is on your right. NavCog. I had my phone in one hand, my cane in the other hand. I never walked with such confidence in my life. And my favorite part about it is the ability and confidence that I have to walk somewhere. And when someone stops me and says, do you need some help? I can say, nope, I got it, thank you. And I'm on my way. We are very impressed by their comments because they said they are very happy to be independent and to be from, uh, freed from relying on someone. Okay, there are more. Tell me about the menu at the Gates Cafe. Their specialties are iced coffee and cappuccino. Do you want to navigate there? Yes, please. Turn right. Proceed 35 meters and turn left at the plant and chairs. You have arrived at Gates Cafe. 
Approaching. Go straight. After escalator. Proceed 50 meters. Approaching. Turn left. Proceed 30 meters. Make a slight right turn. Gate A10 is in 170 meters. Tuskegee Airmen exhibit is on your right. You have arrived. Gate A10 is on your right. So, Namco has reached the point of delivery. The location is limited to uh, Japan and Pittsburgh, but if you are interested in, please let me know. Namco helps users reach a destination by turn by turn instructions. But blind users still need to pay attention to their surroundings to avoid collisions with pedestrians and obstacles. They also need to be, care, um, to be careful for, uh, to not to bear. Bearing while walking causes lots of problems. The mental load is extremely high. It is far from uh, relax and enjoy walking down a shopping mall, for example. So we moved on to the AI suitcase project, a navigation robot project. The idea came from my own experience. I often travel alone with a suitcase. Sometimes it is too much to carry uh, both a white can and a suitcase at the airport. So I found a technique to use a suitcase as an alternative uh, white can. You can see it by video. But I think now you know what I mean. I thought if AI perception, planning, and control can be integrated into a suitcase, uh, it could be my new travel companion and help make my travel life much easier. We started prototyping it at CMU with students. We created this conceptual video uh, to show our goal using a prototype system. Take me to the United Kiosk. Okay, United Kiosk. There is one person in line in front of you. Going to gate A6. Okay, going to gate A6. Train is here. We are entering the door on the left. Escalator in five meters. Escalator approaching. Carry me. Excuse me. Flight has been delayed by three hours. Actually, we really need such suitcase to spend another three hours. The video was created three years ago. At that time, I would say the suitcase was like a two-year-old baby. It took almost three years until we come to this point. Towel shop. Okay, I'll take you to a towel shop. 
Normally, walking itself is a real challenge for me. I can't pay attention to the sounds around me. But now, when I got off the elevator, I noticed good smell, music around me, the escalator over there. I can walk around feeling things surrounds me, and I can feel relaxed. You've arrived at a towel shop. Avoiding a person. We are going to wait in line. Be prepared, we are almost there. These videos are real, uh, not conceptual. I would say the project has now grown up to be about like a 12 old, uh, no, 11. <laughs> 11 or 12 year old children. Okay, so this is a suitcase. So it is open now. And okay, so it is a LiDAR. A LiDAR sensor is uh, measures the distance to the surrounding world, a 360 uh, degree for direction. And the robot estimates an accurate location inside the building. This is an RGB uh, the camera. It is used for detecting people. It detects uh, people from RGB camera and estimates position of detected people uh, from depth camera. And here, GPU PC does this processing. And here is a motor. So you can see motors selected by taking, uh, uh, taking into account working speed and power to uh, overcome bumps and tactile paving. So three, tact uh, three vibro tactile uh, devices are on the top, right, and left of the handle to present turning direction and starting notification. When turning right, the right side vibrates. So users will be ready for the right turn without being notified in audio. When you uh, hold a handle like this, it starts moving. And when you let go of the handle, it stops moving. Speed can be controlled by buttons on the handle. And the walking speed is set zero to one meter or three feet per second. The robot has uh, this battery uh, to serve up all devices for about two hours with less uh, weight. Okay, so for this prototype, we focused on minimizing the size of the robot and the use of a commercial suitcase. So uh, we can confirm if our idea of the suitcase shape is doable. There are uh, many other research items to move um, to make uh, to make this suitcase practically available in a flexible manner. From hardware perspective, we want to see how big the wheel needs to be uh, to naturally move over bumps and tactile paving for the outdoor use. From an interface perspective, uh, we want to design and prototype an interface for exploring in the city. Blind users expressed their dream about walking around the neighborhood just for fun with a suitcase. The new normal has brought new extreme challenges to everyone in our society that we never imagined. It is much harder for visually impaired people to, uh, visually impaired people to handle the changes due to the lack of vision. For example, it is much more difficult to ask passerby uh, for direction when needed. Many have commented um, that they feel uneasy to find buttons for um, elevators, traffic lights, ticket machines, vending machines, and so on by touch. It is almost impossible 
to keep social distancing without vision. I, however, think many such problems could be solved by technologies. AI should be able to analyze the behavior and the distances to the surrounding people, and it should help users move around cities safely and natura naturally by keeping social distancing. Let me uh, show you. We are going to wait in line. Who's next, please? You've arrived at the cashier counter. For this queue navigation, we also use the pedestrian detection with RGBD camera here as well. Our robot first recognizes a person who is waiting at the end of the queue, then follows the uh, person by keeping constant distance. Uh, the location of the queue in front of the cashier is pointed in the topological route map on map server. We can project exact location of the detected people from camera, from camera view onto the uh, navigation map because the lo localization is very accurate with the LiDAR. In this way, we enable the queue navigation by combining computer vision, localization, and maps. Once a new algorithm is created for one form factor, we can expand the idea to other form factors. Line Chaser is a prototype smartphone app to navigate a blind person to the end of a line and continuously report the distance and direction to the last person in the line. It uses the RGB camera in a um, smartphone to detect nearby pedestrians and the built-in infrared depth sensor to estimate their position. There is a video. We present a smartphone-based system called Line Chaser, which assists blind people to stand in lines. Line Chaser estimates the position of the user and nearby pedestrians and determines whether pedestrians are standing in a line. The system then tracks the last person of the line and guides the user to stay correctly positioned by using audio and vibration signals. Our study revealed that Line Chaser enabled the blind participants to complete full standing in line tasks while keeping social distance. So the user interface is different, but the algorithm is similar to uh, the queue navigation of the AI suitcase. Please join our session on Tuesday or Wednesday. The pandemic is disastrous, and it gave serious accessibility challenges to blind people. But people were motivated to invent new technologies to tackle such novel challenges. This is the resilience we have. Resilience has improved our quality of lives. But we need to take one more step after invention. We need to make the technology practically available for users who need it. We call it social implementation. Invention and implementation are a pair of wheels. Great invention cannot change our society for the better if real users do not use them or if they are not implemented in our society. We need social acceptance to implement new technologies. For example, Smart glasses would be very useful for visually impaired people because they can um, help them understand the surrounding world. But sometimes people don't like them due to privacy concern. Safety is also another important topic that we need societal understanding. A case of the autonomous vehicle might clear, uh, clearly uh, explain what I mean. Even if autonomous vehicles become completely autonomous, level 5, do people accept if visually impaired people or children who don't have a driver's license drive a car? 
We have a few bits of good news. Based on the latest research, people understand the importance of augmenting missing or weaker abilities of people with disabilities using new technologies. Kyunjun studied social acceptance for wearable camera devices. People have a negative feeling about using them in public spaces, but feel significantly positive if a device is operated by a blind person as an assistive technology. We also found that people tend to accept autonomous robots with sensors in public spaces if a blind person accompanies them as a guiding device. The use cases to help people with disabilities can motivate inventors, can be a door opener for technology to be understood by society, and can accelerate the implementation of new technologies into our society. This is not a one-time phenomenon. We have seen this repeatedly in our history of technology. The telephone was invented while developing a communication tool for hearing impaired people in the 1800s. You can imagine how speech-based interface was motivated by the needs of people with disabilities. Accessibility needs nurtured um, voice synthesis and voice recognition technologies to be the mainstream and proved the importance of these technologies in our society. The next big thing is, of course, AI. Let me give you some examples. Namco has achieved highly accurate localization. If it is implemented in buildings, it might help people navigate in an emergency evacuation situation. The AI suitcase is now suitcase shaped, but it could be a shopping cart with a holding chair. Then I'm sure elderly people will be happy to use it. Accessibility could be a flagship use case for cutting edge AI technologies and accelerate social implementation by showing the power to change the quality of life. I strongly believe it will lead us to the next generation of breakthrough invention. I've had another role this April as the Chief Executive Director of the National Museum of uh, Imaging Science and Innovation, nicknamed Miraika. Mirai means future in Japanese. It is known as its focus on the frontiers of science. Miraika could be a miniature future city with a restaurant, cafe, shop, theater, classroom, and many futuristic exhibitions. I believe such a place could be an experimental field um, for new technologies and innovation. Kids, elderly, people with disabilities, any visitors can experience new technologies and innovation which may change their daily lives in the near future. In this way, we can expect to accelerate the social implementation. I hope to make Miraikon a role model as, a, uh, as an accessible museum in the world. The year 2030 is the target of UN Sustainable Development Goals. These goals show us a blueprint for peace and prosperity for people and our planet. We found we can contribute many of the goals by um, info accessible information technologies. For example, health, education, work, equalities, and sustainable cities. Some goals are considered difficult to be achieved due to the pandemic. Now is the time we need to change the fate of the sustainable development goals by bringing the latest technologies and then make our global society sustainable. What can the CHI community do? I have already shared one thing with you earlier for accessible smartphones. Now I want to add two more important things. First, from a research prototype to a product. Many Kai papers introduce new ideas and prove 
the novelty, effectiveness, and importance of the idea by showing evidence through experiments. Such papers may influence the de uh, development of new interfaces by someone in the future, but it will take time. We can accelerate the process if you take action. For example, you can find an appropriate entity uh, for, product, for productizing your work, or you can consider becoming an entrepreneur. In this way, your work may have chances to be practically available in a quicker way. Second, it is a bit difficult to explain. As an UI expert and non-disability person, you sometimes come up with a cool idea to help a disability community. Then you will reach out to the target user group to understand the detailed requirements. When they feel it is a great idea and excited about it, then you will keep going with confidence. But sometimes they don't agree with your idea because they don't think it's needed. It may be caused because your idea is too extreme or too technical to understand. Let me tell you this story. One of my friends had a, a, a new idea to help people with visual impairments. He attended many conferences to gather near their needs to, pr to proceed. Unfortunately, many of them didn't agree with his idea. He then decided not to proceed. Later, a similar idea was accepted by a user's community. Sometimes they don't know what they don't know, as you don't know what you don't know. I think it is very important to explain your intention and carefully discuss until you make a final decision for go or no go. I strongly believe it will lead you and users to exciting step for innovation. Leaving no one behind. It is the fundamental principle of SDGs. It seems very difficult if we look only at current technologies. But by developing new technologies and implementing them into our society, we should, be, we should be able to achieve it. By combining my roles as an IBM fellow, a researcher in academia, as a blind user, and as a museum head, I'd like to show how we can achieve an inclusive society using new technologies. I hope to work with you and collaborate with you for new innovations and for removing societal barriers to realize a truly inclusive society. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chieko. Thank you very much for a fantastic talk. I could learn a lot, especially how variety of technologies improve the quality of your life. Now it's time to go Q&A, and I'm going to invite Margaret Barnett, keynote chair, to join me. But please note that the paper session starts now, and please <laughs> go to your session if you are pre presenting. I think there are many questions in the text chat box, but uh, by waiting for more questions, let me ask one question by picking some questions in the beginning. You mentioned you need full spectrum of technologies to achieve the real world accessibility and also maybe interdisciplinary approach is required. Can you give me some examples of a particular technology on the, or other related areas? Okay, uh, thank you very much for your question. So, you know, it's very difficult to, th to think about any unrelated areas for accessibility, but you know, strongly, strongly related areas and necessary areas 
will be depending on the project that you are currently working on. So I want to give some examples through my project. So currently we are working for AI suitcase project and it is designed to uh, help blind users reach a destination like a car navigation system. So blind users need to set up a destination. So when they are at the shopping mall, they have to always tell the robot which shop they want to go next. But this is not my ultimate goal. I want to make the robot flexibly available. Like when I'm at the shopping mall, I want to tell the robot, just go, just start moving <laughs> and tell me whatever you see. And I'm going to pick up if I'm interested in some shop. So to make it real, this is much more difficult. And we need, of course, a lot of te technical challenges. We have to tackle with a lot of technical challenges. Uh, you know, I, I, I think maybe I don't need to tell any uh, computer science area. I think all technology will be needed to make such robot available. But not just technology, we also have to think about how users will perceive surrounding world. Like, you know, if we say people with visual impairments, but I think their perception would be different from each other like, you know, uh, born blind or after birth blind or people with weaker vision. Every group should have different perception and needs. So we need to, you know, do research their perception. To do that, I think we need to collaborate with, we need help from cognitive scientists or maybe psychologists. So, uh, so we, uh, I think periodically we should be, we should, you know, collaborate with various people from various areas. And once it's getting ready to go, I think now next we need to think about regulations. You know, how our each country will accept such autonomous robot with people with visual impairments. Maybe we may need to have a new regulation, so then maybe we should work with a you know, policy makers. So in this way, I think, you know, based on your project, I think it's very important to work together with any related people from various areas. So I really think interdisciplinary approach is very, very important. I hope I answered to your question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Margaret? Yes. Hi. Um, <clears throat> Uh, Chieko, uh, your talk was so inspiring, and, and uh, there are many compliments to you in the chat, and also uh, uh, quite a number of questions. So I'm going to try to pick a few. Um, uh, your work on the AI suitcase is especially gathering questions. So I'm going to start with this one from Vinoba Vinaya Gamurthy. I hope I didn't butcher your name too badly. Um, uh, so uh, one of the things that Vinoba was wondering about is were there any design decisions that you thought of early in that project that at first seemed like a good idea, but then they didn't work? Could you tell us about some of those? Okay, you mean the, you know, if it, the suitcase idea looks pretty good, but uh, maybe earlier it didn't work? Well, so. or just or just pieces of it, things that you discarded along the way while you worked on it? Oh, yes. Yeah, so, you know, discarded, uh, so what should I answer? How should I answer? So it took three, four years until we come to this point. And I think this prototype is the fourth generation. We had first, second, third before, of course. So we had three uh, generations. And the first one was very big. <laughs> Maybe it was big and heavy and noisy. So I had to discard it. And we have tested with blind participants. And you know, they liked the idea very much, but they liked smaller ones. So we had to uh, discard it. And next, uh, 
it didn't look good, you know. <laughs> Maybe there are previous research, you know, people with disability welcome new technologies to improve, you know, their quality of lives, but also they care for how it looks like. And the second gen generation didn't look nice. So we had to look for nicer commercial suitcase and also fit everything inside. So it was a big challenge. I hope I answered to this question. Uh, yes, uh, very, very nice. Thank you. Um, I've picked out another one about the AI suitcase uh, from Jan Smedink. And again, I apologies if I've messed up your name. Um, so um, they're wondering about um, how you perceive, whether you perceive the support of AI, such as in the, in the AI suitcase, as kind of a, uh, as they put it, a third other. So sort of like a replacement for another person. Or is it more like a, does it feel more like a supportive device? So do you see it as sort of a replacement for a, a helping person or more like just a device? That's a good question. Maybe I need to work with some psychologist. <laughs> Maybe there won't be one answer for that question. Because sometimes, you know, people with disability want to be independent. Even they want to be with some person, sometimes they cannot. So we often hear that, you know, they want to go shopping or they want to go to museum a lot, but they some often cannot find their friends. But, you know, sighted people can go if they really want to go. You know, some, it's not required if you go somewhere, you have to have someone. It's not required for you. But for the blind people, you know, to enjoy shopping or museum, it's much better to go with someone. But it doesn't always work. So it depends on the situation. So, but I would say this device will help you be independent. And if you cannot find anyone to go with, I think the suitcase can help. So it depends. <laughs> I see. Um, <clears throat> So maybe um, <clears throat> not entirely tied to the suitcase, but more generally, uh, mm -hmm. Saper Sabeti is uh, asking about trust. And so mm -hmm. they're saying, you know, for, for all of these things uh, that you've been talking about, uh, mm -hmm. has it been really hard to gain blind users trust fully? And, mm -hmm. and, um, and what have you done to, to especially think about that, especially when there's some sort of failure uh, or mm -hmm. false alarm or whatever on the part of mm -hmm. your your mm -hmm. um, your prototypes and your projects. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's a good question. Actually, uh, when we have tested this suitcase a couple months ago, at that time we had you know four or five blind participants there, and we have asked them almost the same questions. How do you feel? Do you feel you know? Uh, any dangerous or you're worried? Can you trust the suitcase? But, you know, I was very surprised because they said, today I tested with a suitcase and I could trust it. So I was very happy. I mean, so they tend to, <laughs> they trust it. But, you know, when I was testing, you know, I know it's pretty good now. The accuracy is now much better than before, of course. But uh, earlier, when I test it myself, I was like protecting myself. <laughs> I thought, you know, this case may bump me to the wall because I knew it was not perfect yet. So I had to protect myself. So when, you know, we tested with blind sub participants, I, I wanted to tell them, maybe you may want to use your hand to protect, but they didn't. But the good thing was it worked, but you know, uh, of course, it doesn't always work at this moment. It's not 100% right now. So I, but my idea is 
it worked, you know. I protected myself using my hand. So I sometimes think we are human. Even we cannot see, we can perceive surroundings. So even if the device is not 100% perfect, still we can supplement. So our perception should supplement what the robot couldn't do. So we won't sometimes say it's a shared autonomous. But, you know, of course, it's for us, we should make it as uh, accurate as possible. And if we have to really ask users to be to sh for shared autonomous, we should let them know, uh, you know, some situation <laughs> where we need their help. Uh, yes. Um, so, um, in, in putting these things together, in, in coming up with these, these wonderful ideas and then bringing them to fruition, um, uh, one question is from Ming Ming Fan. Um, what are some of the biggest challenge, challenges you encountered when desiring, uh, designing these prototypes and how did you overcome them? Um, you know, so this is, you know, kind of new idea. Autonomous robot in general uh, moves autonomously. They are not targeting to lead a person. So um, we had to uh, we had to tackle with various new challenges in terms of autonomous robot to lead humans. Like you know. Robot tries to move, maybe, uh, to try to use the optimal route. Like, if robot wants to turn right, they will pick up the optimized route. But if our robot did that, they will bump me to the wall. So we have to, you know, we have to solve um, these new uh, requirements for autonomous robot. We have to change a lot of, you know, we have to uh, change, we have to um, develop new tech, new components a lot to teach robots. You are leading human. <laughs> and of course, and the size of the suitcase was challenging too. You know, we had to uh, pick, find small but powerful motors. Initial motors were not that strong. It was a little bit weaker. So it moved like a five, uh, one feet. <laughs> one feet or two feet per second. So that's why I said the initial prototype was like a two-year-old baby. So the motor was also challenging, but the good thing was we could find that uh, supports one meter or three feet per second now. So small, to make the robot smaller was really challenging. Yeah. Okay, um. thank you very much. Thank you very much. The, 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 I think there are many questions in the chat box. But uh, and uh, and uh, I'd like to have more uh, lively discussions uh, like this, more longer. But uh, unfortunately, we are now out of time. I'm very sorry. So let's thank Chieko very much for her fantastic talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.